Did you know that you could get even longer interviews with some of the most successful creators? You can with How I Built It Pro. With How I Built It Pro, you get extended ad-free versions of every episode. We cover things like pricing memberships, how to make course creation even faster, building a creator business while also parenting, current events, and more. Plus, you'll get bonus episodes where I offer a behind-the-scenes look at what I'm working on, the revenue for my own creator business, experiments, and video demos of the tech I talk about on this show. You can join How I Built It Pro today for just 5 bucks a month or 50 bucks a year. Sign up over at howibuilt.it slash pro or use the link in your podcast app. There's an old adage that more people are afraid of public speaking than of death, meaning that at a funeral, more people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. I suspect that when push comes to shove, most people would actually choose the eulogy over being put in a casket. But that's besides the point. Public speaking is hard. And truth be told, most people are bad at it. And if you feel like you're bad at it, don't fret. Mike Pacquion is here to help. He's coached people like James Clear, Amy Porterfield, and Donald Miller on public speaking and delivering the best speeches of their lives. And today, he's teaching us his best stuff. A few things that you need to look for are the the greatest gift that you can give your audience, which is has a lot to do with not memorizing your speech. He talks about why most people are afraid to embrace silence. And then he talks about why the best speeches are not necessarily the ones you've given the most. It's a great conversation and I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed it. I'm really grateful that we got to connect at Craft and Commerce in 2022. So enjoy that. Today's episode, by the way, is brought to you by Good Games, Groundhog, and Learn Dash. You'll hear about them later on in the show. For all of the show notes, you can head over to howibuilt.it slash 302. But for now, let's get to the intro and then the interview. Hey, everybody, and welcome to How I Built It, the podcast where you get free coaching calls from successful creators. Each week, you get actionable advice on how you can build a better content business to increase revenue and establish yourself as an authority. I'm your host, Joe Casabona. Now let's get to it. All right, I am here with Mike Pacquion. He is the founder and head honcho of Best Speech Co. And uh, Mike and I met at Craft and Commerce, like many of my recent guests here. And the thing I like about Mike, besides we're geographically in similar places, and is Italian. that he helps... And Italian, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I, I didn't say it the way that like probably like fake Italians would say it. Do you get a lot of like Pacione or whatever? Well, the the H is silent, but the pa- yeah, yeah, like technically it's Pacione or yeah. Pacione. Yeah, but it just it got Americanized at some point. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I get a lot of Casa Bona, Good House. <laughs> it's like it's how I know when someone's Italian if they say Good House after they say my last name. Uh, for the uninitiated, Casa Bona means Good House in Italian. <laughs> yeah. Look, I've I've sent you way off topic already. Sorry, Joe. You can, I know you that's can right. We're like yeah. way off. That's good. Um, uh, but uh, um, Mike, we met at uh, Craft and Commerce. Uh, you spoke at a, I guess like a pre-event thing that yeah. I was under the impression everybody was invited to. And then I later learned that it was like invite only. And I was that dude going like, why didn't you go to this thing? <laughs> what thing? <laughs> oh, cool. Um, and then I went to your session during the actual conference, which was a lot of fun. Um, you gave me some constructive criticism on delivering a, a story. Uh, which was great because I love public speaking and I always want to be better at it. Yeah, and you were you were the model student there because you were willing to get up there. You were willing to try some things. When I do live coaching, I don't let you finish. Mm-hmm. Or I don't necessarily let you finish, right? So that's this is what happened to you. And I distinctly remember you were doing fine. Your gestures were really close to your body. So I was like, dude, can you gesture bigger? And you yeah. did that, which that's hard to do on the fly. 
And then there was a part towards the end where, again, it was it was fine. It was totally acceptable. Nobody in the audience would say, Joe sucks at this. But I just recognized that it would be better if you said it faster. So yeah. I challenged you to do that. And it was so awesome to see everybody in the room just recognize how much more energy you had when you were saying, I don't remember what you said, but when you were saying that part fast. And it totally validated my whole teaching, which like, <laughs> Which is helpful because it's risky bringing people up to the front and then I try to fix it. And if it doesn't work, it's like, well, right. Oh, Joe's he the problem. Fix that's it. a Joe yeah. problem, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. That's like, I mean, you can't, you can't fix some things, right? Like, but no, it was great. Cause like, that's like, you know, I, I do in college, my friends challenged me to talk without my hands. Mm. So like, it's funny that you're like, just you're bigger. I guess like when I'm on stage, I, I, try to like tone it down but i should tone it regular or tone it up a little bit you should you should yeah tone it up yeah tone it up why um, did someone challenge you to speak without your, your hands because all i all i did was talk with my hands right so they're like put they said put your hands behind your back and see if you could talk um and like when i get really animated and i tell a story it's usually like my hands are flying and i can't so um, it was funny because I put my hands behind my back and like totally lost my train of thought. Yeah, and, and so, your like, energy and everything that's good about you probably. Yeah, yeah. So th they just thought it was funny that I couldn't talk without my hands. Mm. Um, okay. All right, let, yeah, me I, let me share some science. We're yes. not going to get through the intro. <laughs> that's I'd cool. Probably that's, share that, this. We're diving right into the meat of it. That's what people want. I probably share this in Boise at the conference. Yeah. My friend Vanessa, so she's pretty great. Science of people is Vanessa Van Edwards. They did an experiment where they wanted to see if people could tell what the best TED Talks were if there was no volume. So I'm going to get the details of this slightly wrong, but it's something like this where, you know how these things work, like you grab a population of people to watch all the videos, and they showed, I think, 20 videos. Turn the volume off, so like literally press mute on your laptop, and just said, okay. Of these 20 videos, I think it was 20, of these 20 videos you watched, which were the which were the good ones? And people could predict what the good ones were just by number of gestures. Wow. That's awesome. Which, if you think about it, it makes sense. And I can always tell if someone is prepared and or how nervous they're feeling by what their gestures look like. Because what should happen, your gestures should be running slightly ahead of your voice. I've never timed it, but I would guess it's like half a second, quarter of a second, just slightly, yeah. slightly before your words get there. But when someone's nervous or I can tell they're not prepared, it's like the exact same thing, like the exact same time. Really? And yeah, and their gestures will usually, when they pause, their gestures will pause too. Those are different body parts, but they, it's all acting in sync because it, it hasn't, the person's not actually as prepared as they should be. Gotcha. So it's almost like that. It kind of sounds like they're like faking the gesture, almost, right? Or like yeah. they're like thinking. Whereas, like when you're excited and you're talking about something, like you get ahead of yourself a little bit. Yes, yeah, so you get ahead of yourself. Yeah, your two arms move differently. Like it's not the same exact gesture from both arms. Right. Right. But that, that's, that's, what like, people... that's like very rehearsed, right? Like no one like gestures. I like a what's a maestro, the conductor. Like they'll gesture yeah. like this in sync. But um, yeah, most people are doing two other, like two different things. But like your hands are two different things. They should be moving. Yeah. It, it, you can use your hands, hands one and hand two to, to indicate different things. And most, right. most people don't do that. Yeah, right, these right, are the, right. Listen, these are the things I, I think about when I'm watching a speech. Even when it's a speech on a TV show. I remember watching, remember House of Cards? That was really big yes. for a while. yes. I forget, I think it's season two, the president, I am 99% sure, studied the way that Obama spoke. Because he's delivering really? a talk. It's like the second or third to last episode. And he's delivering a talk and he's pausing and he's looking around. And I was thinking to myself, like, this is a white actor, President Obama. <laughs> oh my like, gosh. So this that's is the so stuff funny. that actually goes through my head. Yeah. I mean, which is good, right? Because it's like the thing you do. And this is, I don't think, I don't think, I, I wanted you on the show because I don't think enough people think about this, right? I've gone to 
lots of meetups and local events and big events. And you can tell when when someone's prepared and when they're a good public speaker and when they just kind of like threw their talk together. Yeah. Um, I, I was at a... It was WordCamp Chicago. So WordCamps are like these local WordPress events. And Chicago is one of the big ones. And I was giving a talk there that I had given a couple of times before. And in the WordPress space, giving the same talk at a WordCamp is like frowned upon because the talk goes up on the internet. Um, and so this this guy threw a little bit of shade at me. And he was like, oh, I don't deliver the same talk every time. And I was like, yeah, the difference between me and you is you're about to go on stage and you're still working on your slides. Yeah. And I am prepared. <laughs> so, like, guess who gave the better talk? There are people who are able to write a new one every single time and make them really good. Yeah. Glow. So, Glow Atanmo. Yeah. We saw her new speech every single time. And really? I've spoken to some other people that, yeah, Michelle Harris is like that, where she feels like you came here to see me talk. I want to I want to give you something new. Um I am more of the school of thought of uh I want to give you stuff that I know is good and then add in some material that's just for this conference. Yeah, that's that's exactly where I'm at. Like the skeleton is going to be the same and then I'll throw a little, you know, like cuz like somebody gives a talk before me and they say something that's like interesting, like I'll reference it, right? Yeah. Uh you know, I I don't have it mem like I don't have like a script memorized. Um and I I personally don't think that's a great approach. I had to do that for TEDx Cranton. Like they made me memorize a seven minute talk. Yeah, it kills me. Yeah. And I was like, I don't, I mean, the video's up online, TEDx Cranton. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, 2014. I yeah. I was, uh, that was my fedora phase. So you'll see me wearing a fedora. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and it was okay. Like it was, fu- it was a fine talk, but it w- I was like a lot of brain cycles were going towards making sure I didn't forget something. That's right. So this is, yeah. let me just cut you off and talk about this for a second. Yeah. A lot of people want to memorize their talk as a means of de- dealing with anxiety. And I understand the instinct. I do want you to know if that's you, if you're listening to this and that's you, your audience doesn't know what you are supposed to say. And memorizing makes you feel like you're back in high school, middle school, elementary school. The teacher's in the back of the room with a red pen and they're taking points off if you deviate from the script at all. Mm -hmm. Your audience doesn't know what you are supposed to say. It is unlikely that you are Shakespeare with your words. So certain words and phrases, it is essential to get absolutely right. But most of the time... The important thing is that you rehearse it so that it's familiar, but the actual nailing the script 100% is rarely that important. Yeah, I love that. Your audience doesn't know what you're supposed to say. This is something that we were taught in drama club, right? Like, if you forget your line, no one's going to know the exact line. Like, just say something similar, and the audience is going to have no idea. Yeah. So, I... I, 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 I might feel a little bit different about that. Well, here's here. Actually, here's what I think. If you were going on a speaking tour, eventually it'll be mostly memorized, but it won't feel memorized to you. So in other words, you'll know it well enough that someone could throw a bag over your head, put you in a closet mm-hmm. and you can still recite your talk if you deliver it right. enough. But I just don't, I, I just don't think that they're, your audience is there because they want to hear from you and they want you a person on a stage, not you a robot on a stage. Right. Yeah. You know, this made, this made me think of two distinct things from Parks and Rec. Uh, have you ever watched Parks and Rec? A little bit. Okay. So Leslie is giving a stump speech as Amy Poehler's character is giving a stump speech and like Ben, she's in the background, Ben played by... um. Oh yeah, my gosh! Is, I'm I don't forgetting like this guy, name. Adam Scott. I just don't. Adam Scott. Yeah, that's it. From yeah, Se- now he's in Severance, right? Um, yeah. Or was in Severance. Um, anyway, yeah, Adam Scott Ben is in the foreground, and he's like pointing to like ev- like the audience is gonna laugh here, and Leslie's gonna make a joke here that's not gonna land. Like so, she had it like so down her stump speech. Um, so that was like the, what I just thought of there. The other thing I thought about is. Um, Parks, I don't know how many other shows do this, but Parks and Rec, they would get the takes like with the script 
And then they would essentially let the actors like freestyle. Yeah. So like just do just do whatever. And a lot of the times like that made it into the show. Mm. So it's just like it's like you know, you can have like what you want to say, but there's also like the ability to maybe like ad lib or be human like you said. Well, let me let me put it this way. I love that. Yeah. I would say, so this is specific to a speech that you're giving on stage. It's a little bit different on yeah. video, but if you're right. giving a speech from stage, the greatest gift you can give your audience is to be completely present with them. The greatest gift you can give them is to be completely present with them. But that can only happen if you know your stuff, which, by the way, is a little bit of a challenge if you don't practice. So, yeah. of course, you know your stuff, like you're the expert, but just, I mean, you actually, you know your way through the script. So, you know your stuff, you know that the audience is rooting for you. A lot of people don't feel that way, but the audience is rooting for you, unless you're a politician, the audience <laughs> is rooting for you. And number three, you know how to calm yourself down. That's how you can be present with your audience. So, you know your stuff, you know the audience is rooting for you, you know how to calm yourself down. If you can do those three things... There's a pretty good chance you can be present with the with your audience, and that's a huge, huge gift. Because those are the moments where uh, you trip on stage and you can make a joke, and it feels like everybody's in it together. Or those yeah. are the moments where you can adjust to something. Uh, to your point, you can adjust to something that someone said in a previous talk. Or yeah. those are the moments where someone might shout out an answer, and you can roll with it. But that that doesn't work if you're devoting ninety seven percent of your energy to just remembering. <laughs> Yeah. What, what the next sentence is. Yeah, right. And then like again, if someone does shout something out, you're going to be like really thrown off by it. I Yeah. I gave us a, a speech in I gave a talk in Utah about like how I built my LMS stack. And I started off with a story about the Empire State Building and like how it got put together and the overrun and the cost and how most projects don't need to be like that or whatever. And I gave a stat that maybe was like slightly off. Like I maybe I misremembered the number slightly or whatever. Uh, and this guy goes, actually, the the Empire State Building was completed in 1933. And I'm like, well, it's a very good thing. This isn't a talk about the Empire State Building. And then I just like got back into uh, my my thing. And I was like, man, no one cares that you know that. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that works. Yeah. But that somebody else would have been totally thrown off by that. Right, felt like the, right. Felt like the whole speech was invalidated because this little mini thing yeah. that the Empire State Building was said wrong. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is great. I feel like we're very like warmed up right now. And so like we, the greatest gift you can give your audience is to be completely present with them. You can do that by knowing your stuff. That's topic and practice. Understand the audience is rooting for you. Like this is great. Like this is... I've given talks at academic conferences where the audience is not rooting for you. Like they're rooting for you to give them an opening so they can show you how smart you are. Um, but that's not most places, right? Yeah. Like most places paid to be there and they're attending your talk because they are choosing to. Um, and then you know how to calm yourself down. Calming yourself down, is this is probably different for everybody, right? Like breathing exercises, is there like get pumped music? Is there like, like yeah, what I mean, are some common ways you see it? Totally. It is different for everybody. But here, here's one of the things that I try to tell people. So I think there's this, you know, it's often been said that public speaking is the number one fear. My joke is always, I have trouble believing that. Like I have trouble <laughs> believing that someone, <laughs> someone in a den of vipers is sitting there like, well, at least I'm not giving the Q3 update right now. Like, that seems unlikely to me. But people do have a lot of fear around it. and. I, my argument is that fear is actually good. I, I think that you can't, you can't perform to the apex of your ability unless you have a little bit of fear. Yeah. And I think, I think elite athletes will tell you something similar. I will tell you that the, the best speeches that I've given and the best speeches, when I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, the best speeches are not the 74th time you've given the talk. By that point, you know what people are going to laugh at you're you're probably able to deliver the talk while also thinking about what you need to add to the grocery list. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying the talk is no longer good, but just the very best talks are when you have a certain adrenaline kick from 
a little bit of fear. Yeah. Uh, my favorite example, and I think I showed this at one of the one of the workshops that you went to. So after Chadwick Boseman died, I went on a I went on a rabbit hole reading more about him and watching interviews with him. And one of the things I watched was his commencement address at Howard, so Howard University in DC. Uh, this is his alma mater. I think it was 2017 that this happened, maybe 2018, but it was it was shortly after Black Panther came out. So he is like one of the most famous people in the world. One of the coolest people in the world. And if you watch that commencement address, he does a great job with it. At the very end, he ends the talk. His last line, he says, Wakanda for, or he does not Wakanda, he says Howard forever in the style of Wakanda forever. Audience goes nuts. <laughs> the video is great. Like you see people leap into their feet, yeah. uh, whooping their arms around like Arsenio Hall dated reference. <laughs> <laughs> I understood that reference. Yeah. <laughs> And then something really interesting happens, which is he he exits the podium, goes back and shakes hands with, I assume, the president of the university and things like that. And then what you see is you see him take a deep breath and exhale. like. Whew. So I remember seeing that and thinking to myself, well, my goodness, if Chadwick Boseman, on top of the world, one of the coolest people in the world... Who should be more confident than him? Like maybe Tom Cruise, maybe? Yeah. If he is reacting that way, then we all have a little bit of fear in us, right? So the, the key is how do you calm yourself down? And I think the most reliable, there are things about getting yourself pumped up with music or meditating in the back. I think that's really, a lot of that is case by case. But I think the, the biggest things you can do are picture people rooting for you whether it's the actual audience members or not. But really, I mean, when I, I don't speak that often. I, I'm, my role in life is helping other people speak. But when I do, and I'm back in the green room, I am picturing friends and family rooting for me. Like, yeah. I'm going to walk out on that stage, and they're not literally there, but I picture them being behind me, cheering me on. That should calm you down. Yeah. And then like the other thing, though, is is having a plan for the talk, having rehearsed it. Um, yeah. Thinking through when I delivered this line, on what side of the stage am I going to be? Thinking through what am I going to do if people don't laugh at that joke? But the the more that the more that you have a plan, and one of the activities that I give people is to actually write down. Why are you the right person to deliver this talk? Mm. And the more that you can embrace whatever you write down, the more you're going to be able to deal with fear when you get on stage. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, very similar. I picture like the, you know, I picture like one person that I'm giving the talk for. Mm. And I'm like, I'm going to, you know, do a good job for them. They're really going to love it sort of thing. As someone who tells a lot of jokes that don't land, and a lot of jokes that do. Like, I'm, I'm considered a funny guy. But uh, it's uh, as long as it's not horribly offensive, no one's going to care, right? I usually just go like, that was just for me. Like, if nobody laughs, I just go, oh, that was for me. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, love, I love that advice. And, and you're absolutely right. Like, the, when, again, when I was in drama club, like, the adrenaline I got right before I went on stage was like, that gave me like the boost I needed to give like the best performance I could give. And that, Joe, I think it's so cool too. I mean, we're both sports people. Yeah. Which I mean, obviously not everybody listening is, but I, I always try to remind people. <clears throat> so the benefits for speaking, obviously there's business, there are bi business benefits to speaking, but for you on an emotional level, once you're beyond like age 22, you're not in college anymore. You're not playing things you're not playing sports that attract fans right you really don't have that many opportunities in life to get applause and walk out with that adrenaline rush it's probably yeah. a little bit of theater possibility speaking is one of those places and when i'm able to switch someone's mindset from walking on stage and feeling like oh my gosh i have to do this to i want to do this that that is that's when real change happens for people. Ah, uh, that's awesome. 
and you're you're absolutely right. One of the reasons I still I love talking or I love uh, teaching. Yeah. I mean, no one, no one, you know, I'm not like going to stand and deliver like a <laughs> like how to be a good podcaster or whatever, like a course. But you know, I love being in front of people and and doing that entertaining and teaching. And so it's it's you're right. You know, like my. My son like pronounced a word right the other day, and we were like, "Good job!" Like nobody does that for you when you're 23. Yeah. <laughs> my my son's 21. No, he's two, he's two. Um, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, now, as a um, as someone who works with a lot of speakers uh, or um, aspiring public speakers, maybe, and you've uh, I you know. Maybe I did this in the cold open. Only future me knows that. Um, but you've worked with like a lot of well-known people, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you've probably seen a lot of stuff. Uh, what? So I want to ask you, because um, I, I kind of have like an idea of like what is a good talk and what is it, or like how I can give a good talk. Yeah. Um, but what are some of the more common mistakes that you see? Um, and I guess we've been talking mostly about like, delivering a, a speech like in person, but if we could do this for like speeches and, you know, like video, like YouTube videos, yeah. because I know like they're different contexts, but still you're delivering information. Yeah, for sure. I think this, this one is true, whether it's on stage or on video, but it's, it's way worse on video, which is if <laughs> the presenter doesn't have energy. If they sound flat, I think if you're in the same room as other people, even if you sound a little flat, the audience will give you a little more grace. But come on, we've all watched, we've all put on a YouTube video and it's nine seconds in and I'm like, nope, next yeah. one. Yeah. Right. So uh, showing up with energy is really important. And when I say energy, that doesn't mean that you have to be bouncing off walls and cheerleading and things like that. But one of my precepts is that if, if you don't sound entertained by what you're talking about, why in the world would the audience feel that way? Yeah. So it's it's really important to show up with energy. If you're doing video, it's a lot easier to have energy if you're standing instead of sitting. I know that feels weird. You're recording in a room by yourself, but you'll have you'll have more energy that way. You'll also have more energy if your gestures are bigger. Just to, I don't know if, as long as you're not driving listening to this stick your arms out real big right now and, and speak, it's really hard to not have your energy increase by virtue of your gestures being bigger. You'd have to mentally try to have your energy, have your energy stay the same. So uh, <clears throat> showing up with energy is huge. Yeah, I think that's all I, I think that's all I want to say for, I don't know, is there something else yeah. I should say for that? Uh, no, I, th I mean, I think that's good. Should we cut this part out real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Joel, you can cut out like the last like two seconds, like right where Mike ended up. When I literally asked out loud. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You get so probably like uh, twenty five, twelve. I'll clap my hands and then we'll. I'll just dive into my next okay. thing. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I insisted on recording my podcasts standing up for like the first hundred episodes, and then I decided I wouldn't do that anymore. Um, so what I'm going to do, dear listeners, is a little experiment. Uh, I am I am one way right now. In next week's episode, I'm going to be the opposite. I want you, I'll remind you in the next episode too. I want you to write in and tell me if you could tell which was which. This will be, this will tell me how many people are engaged too. But like, I want to know, can you tell, was I sitting or standing in this episode? Was I sitting or standing in the next episode? And And we'll see. We'll see if I... We'll see if my energy levels are similar or or markedly different in an audio only medium. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But yeah, so I I, I but I definitely agree, right? Like I've watched videos where I've definitely watched videos because I was super interested in the content, but like I definitely like scrubbed through a transcript to find it because like the speaker was like, Hi, I'm gonna tell you about this today. And I'm like, be excited. Be excited about what you're talking about. You're about Actually, to teach that, some, someone something new. <laughs> Let me give another tip for that that's helpful. Mm -hmm. You and I both have young children, so we're constantly reading <laughs> kids books. Yes. Like, what, what books are you reading to your son right now? Uh, my son loves The Gruffalo. Have you read Gruffalo. that book? Oh no, my gosh. Uh -huh. 
it's really good. It's about like a mouse walking through a wood and he like hoodwinks all of his predators by making up a gruffalo that turned out to be real. Spoiler alert. It's a really good book. Oh, wow. I should get yeah. into that. Yeah. Uh, we are, I don't I mean, every kid goes through 900 books, right? But I have found that there are certain books that do a good job of coaching me through when I'm supposed to be excited. Like, mm. Mo Willems' books are like that. The Pigeon type books are like that. Oh, nice. The Pigeon Goes nice. to School. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, we have you, we have one of those. I thought it was so, because my daughter was just like, yeah, I want this. And I'm like, you want a book about a pigeon? Like, I'm from New York. Pigeons are the worst thing in the world. Um, but then, like, we read it and it was it was enjoyable. <laughs> so here's the thing. In that book, there are parts where the font is huge. And that's coaching you on the fact that mm. you need to bring the energy to that part. Yeah. And then there is another part where this is in the pigeon wants to go to school where the font gets like really small. So picture big text bubble and the font is just really small and right in the middle. It just says, I'm scared. And that coaches you that your voice oh, should get I love that. quiet. So bring this up. Not because anybody giving a presentation should incorporate kids books, but because we have to bring that same mentality to it though. Right. So there should be parts where we get louder, softer, your voice should go up and down. If it's at the same the whole time, your audience will tune out. Right. Your audience will tune out. Yeah. Even if you have like a really solid, like there's an audio book I'm listening to right now and it's, it's, it's read by a British guy. So immediately I think he's sophisticated and awesome. Right. Yeah. But he is the same the whole way. And it's like, it's an hour and a half drive from here to the Jersey shore. And my wife and I had to change it because we were falling asleep because he's so monotone. Was it monotone? 4, I think we, <laughs> Monica, usually, guy, but. <laughs> no, uh, what is the name of the book? Operation Mincemeat. Interesting. So, Great name. Great title. Well, and it's a Netflix movie that I want to get through the book so I can watch the movie, but like, mm-hmm. I don't know if we're going to make it through the audio book, which is the easiest way to get through a book. Yeah. Yo, that's uh, how I felt. Quick sidebar. That's how I felt about yeah. the Game of Thrones audio books. Cause like my parents live three hours away. So mm-hmm. my wife and I are like, oh, we can go through the audio books and like finish one in like a couple of round trips. The guy's voice for Tyrion, like, just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Because I already just didn't like the voice. I just didn't like the voice. And, like, I already had Peter Dinklage's voice. Mm. So, like, you know, Peter Dinklage is, like, deep and sophisticated and yeah. talks like this or whatever. And uh, and his voice was more like, like, high-pitched Cockney, which is probably closer to what George R.R. R. Martin thought of when he made Tyrion. Yeah. But, like, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> well, that's just you not liking the voice, but overall, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> overall, like the principle here is that your voice needs to change. There should be variety in it, right? As you present, and that's true whether it's video, audio, whatever. Yeah, for sure. So, like you know, I you know, I like to I like to like start big, like, hey, everybody, today I'm gonna like real excited to tell you whatever I'm gonna talk about. Um, one thing I like to do, and I mean, I'm not like the biggest YouTuber, but like I. I like doing this stuff is I, I like to like get close to the microphone like I'm telling you a secret you know like it's just me and you right here I actually hate this thing but I'm going to show you how to use it because it's helpful whatever you know so like I don't know if you could hear any of that because of my compressor but I hope that was good <laughs> no that was good well and <clears throat> here's the thing so when your voice gets quieter it makes the audience feel like you are sharing more of an right. intimate moment yeah yeah I had a guy like, a, can I tell- like from like from the great Gatsby right like she would talk quiet just so you would lean in yeah, that's that is the exact principle. So you, you have to pick and choose when to do that. You can't do it every sentence; it loses its impact. But that should happen somewhere in your talk, whether it's a thirty-minute talk or a one-minute YouTube clip. At some yeah. point, your voice should, your uh, not your voice, but the the volume, the pace, those things should change from time to time. That clues the audience in to this is the important part, and it just brings more energy to the whole thing. Right. It's and it's like it's like, you know, the jump cuts or the zoom in or the different camera angle too, right? Because this is the yeah. other thing with YouTube videos, right? Like a lot of my YouTube videos for a while were just me talking at the camera because I didn't feel like editing. But like those are those are they're not how I deliver in person talks and they're boring videos, right? Because there's no reason for people to pay attention to the visuals right. at that point. Right. That's the equivalent of a slide deck that has one slide in it. Right. right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, which can I ask you actually I I learned this convention in college. Um 
Shout out Dr. Kim Pavlik. Like, I love her. She's great. She was our public speaking teacher. Oh, well, she was multiple teachers, but whatever. Um, and I learned the convention was like basically one slide per minute. Is that like a made up thing or is that like a, is that like a commonly known convention? Well, I doubt there's any science on it, but here's what I will tell you. As the person who is delivering the talk, it's a lot easier for you if you are changing the slides with, I don't want to say rapidly, but the, the slides are regularly changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will help you as the person delivering the talk. So let's look at the opposite side of that. When I was in grad school, there were a ton of teachers who, my whole grad school class, which might be two hours long, would have three slides, four. Ugh. And what that means is that every single time there's a slide, like every slide is its own long speech. So picture that versus the other side of it, which is what I would recommend, is that the slides are regularly changing. Each slide, you just have to remember a little bit of information that is so much easier for your brain. Yeah. So one slide per minute, I don't know, maybe. I shoot for more than that. I shoot for probably every 30 seconds or so. Okay. But one a minute is... is that's a good thing to shoot for. Yeah, yeah, for sure, right? And again, it, like it kind of mixes it up, and because I think a lot of people, again, probably fall into the trap of putting everything they want to say on their slides. Yeah, and like that's just not, you know. I think I heard like seven lines at most on a slide, and that even feels like too much for me, unless oh, that's it's way like, too much, right? Like, yeah. So, um, yeah, okay, that was like a, a quick side quest. Well, no, let so, me hear just one yeah. other thing on that real yeah. quick because. If, when people are doing it online, like that's a problem if yeah. the same slide stays up there versus if the slide changes. So the slide changing a lot is a, a way to trick your audience into paying more attention to you. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think again, like I think for like when I would make videos professionally, we tried, we tried to shoot for like every like 15 to 40 seconds, like there would be a visual change and like maybe mm. even 15 to 30. Um, that's why I spent so much time on my street. Maybe we can talk about this in pro. We're going to tell horror stories and how I built it pro, by the way, how I built it slash pro. Um, but maybe I could talk about like the way I configured my stream deck. Cause this is like, so I could like easily change between like slides and my face and camera angles again, without having to do too much editing, but still making like a, yeah. a dynamic talk. Um, so presenter sounds flat. That's something that anybody, whether they're giving a talk, IRL or via YouTube or webinar or Zoom or whatever, that's something that they can fix. What are some other common mistakes? Yeah, let's zoom through these. So the, the next one is, and this is hard, most people over talk. Said differently, most people are not concise. And where I want to challenge people, <clears throat> whether this is face-to-face or on virtual, there will come a time if you haven't battle-tested your script already. There will come a time where you either look out at your audience or you imagine your audience. So if it's on virtual, you're just imagining your audience. And you think to yourself, do they get it? And in those moments, if you're like most people, you have to respond to your own brain. And your brain's asking you, do they get it? And your response is probably, I'm not sure. I'd better keep explaining. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> it's like I was uh I was I was doing a workshop for a group of nurses recently and and I was just joking. It's like you're looking out at the audience and they look maybe a little bit confused and you're thinking to yourself, well, if I just give them one more peer-reviewed survey or one more peer-reviewed study, <laughs> then they'll get it. <laughs> it's a lot easier for your audience if you give them less information. So my rule of thumb is I would always rather err on the side of less information versus more. Said differently, most of us, because we're experts in what we're talking about, most of us want to force the audience to go scuba diving. So in other words, force them into a deep dive. Take them snorkeling instead. If they have more questions, they can always ask you afterwards. You can direct them to a part of your website. But when when you force people into the deep dive, what will usually happen is they will end up checking out. I used to teach a required class to college freshmen at 8 a.m. on Monday mornings. So I know the constant dread of wondering if anyone is paying attention to my talks. 
I also knew that they were a captive audience, something that you don't have the benefit of when you are presenting at a conference or online. So you need to keep your audience engaged. And that's where Good Games comes in. With Good Games, your audience doesn't just listen to your presentation, they become part of it. Gamification makes presentations a living conversation between you, your participants, and the material. Players can play from any browser on any device, and they'll remain totally anonymous while brainstorming, providing honest feedback, or even just competing against fellow attendees. Good Games works great for in-person, online, or hybrid events. To see free live demos every Thursday, subscribe to Good Games on YouTube. And to learn more, go to howibuilt.it slash games. Be sure to mention How I Built It to get 10% off. That's howibuilt.it slash games and mention the show for 10% off. This episode is brought to you by LearnDash. Look, I've been making courses for a long time. I've taught at the college level and I've created curriculums for several different organizations, including Udemy, Sessions College, and LinkedIn Learning. When I create my own courses, there's no better option than LearnDash. LearnDash combines cutting-edge e-learning tools with WordPress. They're trusted to power learning programs for major universities, small to mid-sized companies, startups, and creators worldwide. What makes LearnDash so great is it was created by and is run by people who deeply understand online learning and adds features that are truly helpful for independent course creators. I love the user experience. And now you can import Vimeo and YouTube playlists and have a course created automatically in seconds. I trust LearnDash to run my courses and membership, and you should too. Learn more at howibuilt.it slash learndash. This episode is brought to you by Groundhog. Groundhog is an open source CRM and marketing automation suite for serious agencies, small businesses, content creators, e-commerce experts, and WordPress professionals. Groundhog allows you to create funnels, automate email, and SMS communications, and manage your contacts from the comfort of your WordPress dashboard. Unlike other SaaS CRM platforms, Groundhog does not charge you a success tax. Groundhog charges a flat rate fee, regardless of the size of your list. Groundhog will never charge you more as your list grows. It also integrates with all of the top WordPress, e-commerce, LMS, and membership plugins to create a unified customer experience. Start now with a 14-day demo for $1. Go to howibuilt.it slash groundhog. That's howibuilt.it slash G-R-O-U-N-D-H-O-G-G. Or use the code How I Built It for 20% off your first year of any plan. Thanks so much to Groundhog for sponsoring this episode of How I Built It. Here's, here's a little trick that I started doing in college when I was teaching at the college level. Because, you know, like they're like half checked out anyway. Yeah. But I always had this one student who looked really confused. And I, was, I would do this. I was worried that like she had no idea what I was talking about. And then, like, I pulled her, and I'm like, do you, "Are you understanding?" She's like, "Yeah, everything makes sense." And I'm like, "So, I'm like, your face is just like that." I didn't say that, obviously, <laughs> but so, uh, so I, oh, so Mr. I said, "Good house. This is what my face looks like." Yeah. <laughs> um. So I started doing this. Are there any questions, comments, concerns? And then I would say, "Blank stares mean yes," which means like, if nobody says anything, I'm moving on, and I assume that you've got it right. And like, sometimes I'll say that in my actual talks, like coming up on Q&A, but like, I think that really makes sense because people are only going to take like one or two things away from your talk mm -hmm. anyway, right? Like they're going to like, they're going to grab that not going to be like, this is the thing that I'm implementing today or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And actually let's use that to kick off to the next thing. So my guess is a lot of times that resulted in there being silence. So are there any questions, blah, blah, blah. Some of those people have questions. A lot of times they don't. Right. Frankly, it can be hard to come up with a question when someone's in the middle of a talk. So the, the next mistake that people make is they're scared of that silence. I would tell you that silence is actually strength. 
Said differently. A lot of people start throwing um, uh, like, really. Uh, what's another one? Actually, throwing mm. in words just for the sake of... I can't end the sentence and then go to silence. People will think I don't know what I'm talking about. No, actually, right. silence is really, really good. Only a confident presenter will use silence. So there's been some really interesting research. I always cite this company in the Bay Area called Gong. They have studied, uh, they use AI to look at phone calls from salespeople. One of the things that, so they're trying to figure out like what makes for a good salesperson. And one of the things is silence. So they, they took a look at regular, I don't, know, I don't know if they use regular, average, whatever, some middle ground salesperson versus the best salespeople. Well, the middle ground salespeople were willing to pause, after they said the price, middle ground salesperson is willing to pause less than one second before they keep talking. The best salespeople were willing to pause for more than two seconds. And their conclusion is that that symbolizes a rock solid confidence in your pricing. And you can imagine that. I've certainly done that before where I'm like, and uh, the cost for that is 9,500. But uh, if you don't have that much money, then we can totally <laughs> tell you know, be like, yeah, I'm like financing right. for the person I'm talking to. They haven't even opened their mouth yet. Right. Versus just saying a confident and the cost on that is 9,500. One, 1,000, two, 1,000. And just let it hang out there because that's what a confident person would do. So right. most people are scared of silence. I would encourage you to embrace it. I like I like that because it lets your point land too. Like, and um, I mean, in the sales thing, right? Like you don't, don't negotiate against yourself. Like that's like, when I was buying a car, I, my wife got so, my, I instructed because like she gets really uncomfortable with stuff like this and yeah. I like thrive on it. Um, and I was like, don't say anything. No matter how uncomfortable you get, don't say anything. And she's like, okay. Uh, so like the guy said something and I like counterpoint and then he counterpoint. And then I just sat there for like a minute. A minute? And- <laughs> what? <laughs> it, it felt like five. It was probably like 30 seconds, but I sat there till you could feel it. And then he started negotiating against himself. He's like, well, you know, I could probably do this. And I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do that. Great. Um, and it was like in negotiating, which is, this is not about negotiating, but like silence could be like the differentiator. Yeah. I feel so. Yeah. But most people feel like they need to throw. Right. More words in and behind the scenes, what's probably happening to you, by the way, if you're one of those people who says, um, uh, like really things like that all the time, what's probably happening is you're all at the, because of that, you're probably not breathing. And when you're not breathing, that's making you more nervous. Mm. So, you know, public speaking is the number one fear. One of the reasons why, because here's how most people talk. Hey, I'm talking to Joe right now. And Joe lives in downtown Pennsylvania and Joe da da da, da and talking, talking, um, uh, talking, talking. I'm like out of breath. You will hear me exhale. Yeah. Well, nobody can feel confident that way. So right. embrace silence. Yeah. I like that. Okay. Let me do one more. Okay. Yeah. Sounds Does one good. More we'll do, ten yeah, more? one, one more, more works. And then I'm going to, we'll get to the big question. Okay. I, I've given mostly tips on the way that you deliver a talk. And I obsessed about the, the writing of the talk too. One of the things that I think I'm able to help people the most with is their introduction. And I think one of the reasons why people get so nervous is because the first like 30 seconds on stage feel so awkward. What most people do to start a talk, and you see this on YouTube to a certain extent too, is you talk about like where you're from or, hey, it's great to be in Cincinnati boy, those Bengals are doing great this year, right? Like some, <laughs> you're literally talking, but you're not advancing the, the topic. And again, I understand why this happens. I would encourage people to attack it. Attack the presentation, attack the video. Don't wait for approval from the audience. You actually need to lead them. So the metaphor that I always give people is you need to push the audience into the pool. And what most presenters do is they start off with just a, a lovely bunch of words about, 
the city that they're in, or if you just got introduced by someone, because a lot of times that on stage, a lot of times there will be an MC who introduces you and reads the bio. So a lot of people will start and be like, well, that was a really nice bio, Chris. Boy, you got to send that to my <laughs> wife. Right? Like See, all the time people say things like that. <laughs> you need to push the audience into the pool. So I have a whole freebie on that that, that we'll nice. link to. But just to give you general ideas, surprise the audience. Like, obsess about your first sentence. Surprise the audience. Start with a story. Yeah, start with a story. Well, first of all, that freebie, uh, what's the link that people can find that at? Yeah, so that's you go like best, super valuable. Yeah, yeah bestspeech.co slash Joe. Bestspeech.co slash Joe. Love yeah. it. Um, and that, that'll, I have a freebie for you on how to hook your audience. So it's how to hook your audience in the first five minutes. And I've got several different ways of doing that. But it's like two big ones are surprise the audience or use stories. That's great. That's like stories is the one. Because like, you know, I remember when I first felt like I was a good public speaker. Yeah. And it was like after I started using stories. So mm-hmm. Before, I would say, hi, I'm Joe. I'm a front-end developer at blah, blah, blah. Today, I'm going to talk to you about name of my talk. Already all, people know that already. They're here. They read the, they read the dais. They, they, they know why they're here. Uh, and then I started switching it to like, oh, what's a common story I tell in my talks? So about the contract of the Death Star or something like that. You know, I'll tell a story about... Or, Walt Disney is a good one, right? Did you know that Walt Disney had a character before Mickey Mouse. And he lost Amazing. that character. Yeah. That's the first line of your talk? Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, Thank you. So picture yeah. Joe walking out to the middle of the stage. Everybody's expecting him to talk about how nice it is to be here. And instead of that, he hits the center stage and first words out of his mouth. Pauses for a second, looks at the audience. Spotlight on him. Did you know that Walt Disney had a character before Mickey Mouse? Ooh, audience leans in. That's exactly what you want to happen. Yeah. That gave you doing that, you using my words just gave me chills. I gotta get I gotta get back to speaking again. <laughs> I gotta find some events to speak at. Um well, we can talk about stories quite a bit. Uh, that was the first training that I did for you. Here's what I always just a quick plug for stories. Just I want everybody to picture a speech they've seen that got a standing ovation. Was the standing ovation because it was really accurate procedurally? <laughs> Boy, that's step four in how to use JavaScript. Oh, gosh. Wow. Yeah. So good. Console.log? What? <laughs> of course not. Uh, it's not always because of stories, but I would say most of the time there is a story that is being told that inspires the audience. Yeah. So that can't be the entirety of your talk. I mean, there needs to be substance. Well, sorry, let me rephrase that. Stories, when used well, help to prove a point. So there needs to be points made in the talk. You can't just be stories. But it's like, those are the things that move people. Yeah, it's the thing that opens the thread, right? Like, and or like like you said, illustrates, right? I talked about like how I saw Blink-182 at a concert and... Everyone knows Mark, Tom, and Travis. Like, they love Mark, Tom, and Travis. But what they don't see are the sound techs making sure that everything sounds good. The lighting guys, the pyrotechnic guys who are making sure the F word is actually on fire. True story, by the way. When, uh, for when I saw Blink-182, the curtain dropped and the F word was just in flames in the background. And <laughs> as a 15-year-old, I thought that was the funniest thing ever. Um, and so, you know, the story illustrates that, like, yeah... Uh, it was about like WordPress programmers, but those aren't the only things you can do to contribute to WordPress was basically my point. But that story illustrates that. And I think mm-hmm. that's really... So before we get to the big question, oh, and we are coming up on time. Um, what is one thing you recommend to help people come up with a story to tell? To come I did up not with prep story? you on this. Like, like, I know like when we did the workshop, right? You gave us a, like an exercise for... Yeah. yeah. Oh, like, like where to find stories in your own life? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, so <clears throat> a few places you can look. Number one, I would think of people in your life that you've known for a while and stories that come to mind when you think of those people. Husbands, wives, 
brother, sister, family members. Those are the easiest ones. Coworkers can be really good for that. So those are great places to look. Um, <clears throat> I think, though, what I usually recommend to people as a starting point, get you don't have to literally get a scroll of paper, but I, I picture like a big scroll of paper, like King Arthur times 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> but you're 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 setting it out long ways, and you're just making a timeline of your own life, and you're you're breaking it out by decade, or maybe stage of life is a better way of thinking about that. So for me, it'd be like um, my son was born 2019. That would be a, a little marker. Married in 2015. Yeah, 2015. Married. I would have a marker for like when I moved to Portland. I would have a marker for when I lived in Boston. Anyway, I don't need to go through my whole life timeline, but I'm putting all those markers out for different stages of life, and then I'm just trying to think of things that happened in those stages of life. Those are usually, that will usually generate a lot of stories. Yeah, love that. A lot, I mean, I, yeah, I think, and I think maybe you said this, or maybe this is just something I've internalized, but like, more stuff has happened to you than you think, probably. Like, yeah. Most people are like, my life is boring, but like, my life is mm, boring. probably have some good stories. Yeah, um, I went to a Phillies game once. Yeah, <laughs> um, awesome. So we'll end with this first step. T- what is the first step somebody can take to being a better public speaker? Yeah, so I think the first thing that you need to do is you need to know that it requires not winging it. Yeah. So run through it before you get on stage, before you publish it to YouTube. One of the reasons when I work with people one on one, one of the reasons they can walk on stage with confidence is because by the time they're getting on stage, they already know it's good. But what most people do, and you and I have talked about this, that a lot of word camp type places, the first time the words are leaving their mouth is when they're in front of their audience. Yeah. Just think of the think of the reputation that's at stake. Think of the money that's at stake if you do a good job and then everybody wants to check out your website. Most people, the first time the words leave their mouth is when they're walking on stage. So pretty please, with sugar on top. Rehearse it to the point where it feels comfortable. Yeah, I like that a lot. I'll share this with you. I, uh, for a long time, I didn't rehearse my YouTube videos. And I shot those at least twice before I got to the publishable one. So like, uh-huh. just like, save yourself time and energy and rehearse it. Like, because, you know, when the camera's on, you're on. And then you're like, I'm going to edit this and it'll be good. But like, aside from Star Wars 1977, you can't fix it in the edit, probably. Um, awesome. It feels, like the, it feels dumb rehearsing. I realize that. But yeah. But the value's there. Yeah, for sure. Mike, this was amazing. Uh, if people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Yeah, totally. Uh, so Best Speech is the website. As I said, Best Speech... Or I guess I should say the whole website. You can't just type best speech. Bestspeech.co and then bestspeech.co slash Joe will get you to the freebie that is uh, the freebie. <laughs> I can really talk. Uh, <laughs> how to hook your audience in the first five minutes of your talk. So it'll walk you through specific creative ways that I've used to hook the audience right away. I work with people one on one. I do group coaches. So it's good to fill out that form as well. You'll get on my email list and you'll know when those things happen. But uh, awesome. one other plug I should do, Best yes. Speech Podcast, I interview speakers, they tell stories, they talk about times where they've done really well, times they've bombed. So check us out, the Best Speech Podcast. Love it. I will link to all of that and everything we talked about in the show notes over at howibuilt.it slash 302. If you want to hear some quick horror stories from Mike and myself, Become a member of How I Built It slash pro of How I Built It Pro at How I Built It slash pro. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Awesome. And thank you to our sponsors, Gap Scout, Groundhog, and LearnDash. Thank you for listening. And until next time, get out there and build something.